I want you to think for a minute about somebody in your family who's hard to please. Maybe it's a mom or dad, maybe it's a husband or wife, maybe it's a girlfriend or boyfriend, or maybe it's a brother or sister. I mean, let's face it, it's hard to live with or to deal with somebody who's hard to please. She doesn't even try. <laughs> Let me ask this question. Do you ever look at God that way? Do you ever look at God and say, you know what, no matter what I do, I don't seem to measure up? I mean, after all, remember that God is perfect. God is holy. And so some people struggle with the idea of a heavenly father who has never sinned, who's never messed up, who's never broken the rules. And so how do we please God? You know, if you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you might think um, pleasing God is by keeping rules and regulations. And when I say that, by rules and regulations, by keeping law, we're not just talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the 400 plus laws that are associated to the Ten Commandments. But how do you do that? In fact, James tells us that if you break one part of the law, it's like you've broken the entire law. And so the question remains, how do we please God? How do we please God? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, how to please God. So I can get everybody to please stand. Let's go ahead and turn over to Matthew 22. And this morning we're going to be reading from verses 34 through 40. Verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now when he says prophets, he's talking about the, the, the writings of the prophets. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I do believe that there is an inherent desire in each and every one of us to love you, Lord, to, to please you, Lord. There's just something deep inside of us that just longs to make you happy. So, Lord, help us to understand exactly what love is this morning. Help us to understand exactly how we can please you, Lord. Lord, just open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want you to notice the question that this lawyer asked. Now, when I say lawyer, I need to clarify. Uh, when I talk about lawyer, I'm not talking about lawyers like we have today. In the Bible, a lawyer was somebody who was an expert on the Old Testament law. A, a lawyer in the Old Testament would be a person who knew the Torah inside and out. Who knew the law inside and out. And notice this lawyer's question in verse 36. He says, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now to really understand what's going on here, you've got to kind of see it within context of this section of scripture. In fact, what you really need to do is you need to go back and read about Jesus' encounter with the Sadducees. Because what's going on in this passage of scripture, which we're told in verse 35, is that Jesus is being tested. You've got the, Saris, the Sadducees who start off trying to trip Jesus up, and then later on where we're at, you're going to see that the Pharisees are now taking their turn. But let's, let's just go back for a minute. Let's step back for just a minute and, and look at what happened previously. Previously, the Sadducees had come to Jesus, and they had this question. They created this uh, fictitious story about a woman whose husband died, but he left her childless. And if you know the Old Testament law, the requirement was that if a husband died and he didn't leave his wife any children, 
the requirement was that one of his brothers would have to marry her to give her children and to carry on his brother's legacy. And so in this fictitious story, uh, the next brother dies, leaving her no children. And this happens for a total of seven brothers. All of them die without leaving this woman any children, any inheritance, until finally the woman herself dies. And so this is the question from the Sadducees to Jesus. The question is, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now, if you think about it logically, logically you would think, well, it was either the first husband or the last husband, right? But here's how ridiculous this question is. Here's how deceptive this question really is. Sadducees don't believe in life after. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so all they were really doing was trying to trip Jesus up. But I like how Jesus silenced them. Jesus basically said, you know what, you don't understand the scriptures. Because if you understood the scriptures, you'd understand that there is no marriage in heaven. That we're going to be like the angels. And so in our story, now all of a sudden we've got the, the Pharisees coming and taking their shot at Jesus. And so they send one of their brightest lawyers in to test Jesus. And what he's testing them about is concerning the law. That would kind of be like the, an IRS agent coming to visit you and asking you the question, well, which one do you think is the most important tax law for you to keep? I mean, how do you answer that question? We're talking about a loaded question. I mean, if you're smart, you know what you should say? All of them. Because if you don't, you know what, you might just get audited because that IRS agent is going to take a look and he's going to wonder which of those tax laws that you deem is less important. And so you say all of them. And so the question is, how should Jesus respond to this question? I mean, he could ignore it. He could ignore it. He could say, you know what, you are the lawyer, you're the expert on the law. So why don't you tell me what the greatest commandment is? But that's not what he does, is it? It's not what he does. What he does is he takes the Old Testament and he breaks it down into two commandments, love God and love others. You know, if you took everything in the Bible, from the first page to the last page, and you combined it, you could sum the entire Bible up in those two commandments. It's kind of like reading a book, and then after you've read it, you get the gist of what it's all about. I mean, a book might be 300 pages, but if you know it, and if you understand what you've read, you could probably sum that book up in a, in a sentence or two, couldn't you? And that's what Jesus did. That's because Jesus knows the Bible inside out. Jesus knew the Torah. He knew the law like nobody else could possibly know the law. And so the question is, Why? It's because he was the architect of the Bible. He was the inspiration behind the inspiration. Notice 2 Peter 1.21. It says, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Notice 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All scripture is inspired by God. Now, we may need to make sure we clear this up. What is Scripture? Scripture is what I have right here in my hand. Scripture is the Bible. And what 2 Timothy 3.16 says is that all Scripture is inspired. All of it is from God. And so let me say this. If Jesus helped write the Bible, don't you think he knows what's in it? Don't you think he knows the Bible better than anyone else? Don't you think he knows the Bible inside and out? I mean, that's why he was able to sum up the Bible literally in two commands, to love God and to love others. You know, as a church, we're trying to live out those two commandments here. That's why our mission statement is loving God and loving others by having open hearts and open arms. That's keeping the commandments that's living out what God has called us to do. That's the Bible in a nutshell, loving God and loving others. You know, next week we're going to talk about loving others, so I don't want to spend too much time this week, but you know what? It really is hard separating those two. But let's start by asking the question, what does love look like? 
you realize that in the English language, that there are about 150 words that people use to try to describe love? Words like heart, family, passion, romance, forever, marriage, and of course, my personal favorite, chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate. The problem with chocolate, though, is when I look at the scale, it doesn't love me back. When I look at the scale, I realize that this is a one-sided love affair. <laughs> And I keep going back. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think that's the problem with the word love today as well, though. There's a lot of people who use the word love, and it really isn't love. So much of when people use the word love, the idea in their mind is, what can you do for me? Instead of, what can I do for you? So much of what the world sees love as is self-serving versus sacrificial. And I want you to think about the difference between those two. I want you to think about Jesus coming to this earth and sacrificing his life on the cross. Was that self-serving or sacrificial? That was sacrificial. I want you to think about your own kids for a minute. I want you to think about your kid being sick and you staying up all night taking care of your kid. Is that self-serving or is that sacrificial? <laughs> I want you to think of Bill and Stacy, who aren't here this morning, collecting bottles to send money to orphans in Uganda. Is that self-serving or is that sacrificial? That's sacrificial. And so if we're going to love God, what should our love look like? Sacrificial, right? That's what God is calling us to do, to sacrifice our lives on the altar of service to others. That's how we love God. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, Jesus says again, He says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And then in 2 John 1, 6, John says, And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. And so you see, it's really, really hard to separate loving God from keeping his commandments. But so that we don't get legalistic with this, let me remind you that Jesus, when he talks about commandments, he's not talking about rules to obey. God isn't saying do this or else. That's the Old Testament law. We don't live under that law. In fact, we live under a different law, and that law is the law of love. When Jesus talks about uh, commandments. He's talking about loving God and loving others. He's not talking about obeying rules and regulations. But here's the cool part. When you love God and when you love others, you know what? You really are fulfilling the law. You're fulfilling the intent of the law. Now, I've said this before, but I'm going to bring it up. There is a difference between the letter of the law and the intent or the spirit of the law. And it breaks my heart when I see Christians trying to live by the letter of the law instead of living by the spirit or the intent of the law. Amen. You remember Jesus, amen? You remember the problems he had with the Pharisees, especially over the Sabbath? They were always getting on to him because he was healing on the Sabbath. They were following the letter of the law, but Jesus was following the spirit of the law. Amen. Because man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And so we live under a different law, the law of love, and not the letter of the law. Now someone might say, I'm not sure I know what love is. And so I'm not sure if I really know if I'm loving God and loving others or not. You know, maybe you grew up in a home that had very little love in it. I mean, let's face it, not every home is a loving home. Maybe you were in a marriage that had a little love in it as well. Maybe the only thing you learned from that marriage was how much one person can hate another person. And so you might be thinking, well, what if I'm thinking I'm loving God, but I'm really not? You know what? That's a great question. Like I said earlier, there are 150 words in the English language that people use to describe love. And, and many of those words have nothing to do with love. At least love in the biblical sense. At least love in the way that God means love. And so what should we do? 
What we should do is look to the Bible to define what love is. To look to the Bible, not to the world, to define love. Like I said, they've got a lot of things that they call love that don't match love as far as it's described in the Bible. You know the best example, I've already mentioned it, the best example in the Bible of love is what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary's cross. The Bible says there's no greater love than when one person lays down their life for another person, and that's exactly what Jesus did. But you know, there are all kinds of other stories in the Bible to show us what love really looks like. And the great story is the story of Ruth and Naomi. And you guys know that story. Naomi, her husband Elimelech, uh, her son Malon and Chilion, they uh, leave Judea, they leave Bethlehem because there's a famine in the land, and they go to Moab. <clears throat> when they're there, her two sons end up getting married to two Moabite women. But life's hard on them. First, Elimelech dies, and then Malon dies, and Chilion dies. <clears throat> and then Ruth hears, or Naomi hears that <clears throat> there's no longer a famine over in Judea. And so she's planning to go back, and so she tells her daughter-in-law, you go back to your family. But Ruth won't go. In fact, let's go ahead and read about that real quick. In Ruth 1, 15 through 17, it says, Then Naomi said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. <clears throat> Return after your sister-in-law. Return after your sister-in-law. Your sister-in-law's gone. You go ahead and go back to your family. But I love what Ruth says. Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my, my God. When you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. Is there any doubt that Ruth loves Naomi? Do you know what? Even in that story, we also see Naomi's love for Ruth. Naomi knew that there was little to no chance that she could provide a new husband <laughs> for Ruth. That's why she told her, go back to your family. It's like, go start a new life over here. And so in that story, we see love coming from both directions. What about the friendship of Jonathan and David? Jonathan was King Saul's son. He was the heir apparent to the throne. But he loved David so much. And because he recognized that David was God's anointed one, that God, God was anointing David to be the next king, that he was able to say, you know what? The kingdom is yours. He loved David enough to put pride away, to give up his birthright and say, you know what? You, you're going to be the next king. I mean, there's all kinds of stories in the Bible about what love looks like. And we can't sell ourselves short. We can't sell the word of God short by defining love by what, by, by what the world says. We need to define love, especially as we talk about loving God and loving others the way the Bible describes love. And it is never self-serving. It is always sacrificial. That's what real love looks like. In the last few weeks, I've talked about being sold out for God. I've been talking about being all in. That's how we love God. And you realize verse 37 is a quote from Deuteronomy 6.5. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might. With all your might. That's being all in. That's being sold out. That's how we're supposed to love God. That's how Ruth loved Naomi. And that's the way that we need to love God. We need to say to God, where you lead, I will follow. God, what you love, I will love. God, what you see as valuable, I will see as valuable. God, what you hate, I will hate. God, I'm all in. God, I'm sold out for you. And so let me ask this. What are some practical ways that you can express your love for God this week? How about reading your Bible? Some of you know this. Some of you probably don't. Do you realize that the Bible is a love story? Mm 
about God's love to humanity. And I think if God wrote it, we ought to read it. So read your Bible. What are some other ways that we can express our love for God? How about finding some place to volunteer? How about making a difference in the world? We've got people that volunteer at the Senior Center. We've got people that volunteer here over at Shim. We've got people who volunteer at the Gleaners. All trying to make a difference in this world. What are some other ideas? How about giving blood? Kelly gives blood. Imagine being in the hospital and needing blood. Imagine it being you. Wouldn't you be glad to know that somebody donated blood so that there'd be blood for you? Wouldn't that be a service to humanity? What are some other ways? How about you see somebody down and out? Somebody who looks sad. How about coming alongside them and bring a little sunshine into their lives? What I'm going to challenge you to do is when you get up tomorrow morning, start your day by saying, God, here I am. Use me. God, here I am. Use me. I'm going to close the service with a video. And in this video, it, it really shows us that we love God best by loving and serving others. Let me say that one more time. We love God best by loving and serving others. I do apologize, we've had some trouble with her video the last couple weeks. We'll try to get the bugs worked out on that. But the essence of what was being said really has to do with how do we love God? How do we love God? We take the freedom that he has given us in Christ, and we don't use that freedom on ourselves. We use that freedom to serve others. That's how we love God best. We love God best by loving and serving others. Amen? I want to open up an invitation. I don't know if there's anybody here today that...